Hi, I'm Peter May. I'm the General Manager of Food Safety and Regulatory Affairs at Food Standards Australia New Zealand and I'm here to talk to you today about a revised Food Standards Code. The project to revise the Food Standards Code commenced after a court decision in 2009 when it was identified that the current Food Standards Code, which has been in operation since the early 2000s, was out of date and needed renovation, needed some revision. What I'm going to talk about today is why we've changed the code, what we've changed and what industry might need to do to deal with the fact that there is a revised code commencing next year. The Food Standards Code is a legislative instrument made under Commonwealth law, but it doesn't in fact have effect on its own. The Food Standards Code is implemented through state and territory laws and New Zealand law. In relation to imported food, there are provisions in the Imported Food Control Act that require imported foods to comply with standards set out in the code. So one of the first things that we had to do was make sure that the code integrated properly with the state and territory laws and the Commonwealth and New Zealand laws. So as I said, what I'm going to talk about is why the Food Standard Code has changed. What the court case in 2009 told us was that the code which had come out of work done initially by the National Health and Medical Research Council and then by uh, predecessor bodies of Food Standards Australia and New Zealand was out of date and didn't reflect modern drafting style. The court had difficulty applying the code under New South Wales law because requirements that were set out in the code weren't clear enough to satisfy the standards required by the New South Wales law. So what we did after that case, having identified that there was a problem, was to get the Office of Parliamentary Council to give us advice about what needed to change. And we then consulted with state and territory regulators and New Zealand regulators to get their views about what needed to change. What we identified was a large number of issues where change was necessary in order to ensure that the code better met the needs of all users of the code, whether they're regulators, people working in industry, people working in retail or wholesale, or other users of the code, including consumers. We needed to ensure that the code could provide enforceable provisions, that it worked with the state and territory laws and other laws, so that the code provisions could be effectively enforced. We needed to make the requirements clearer and we needed to make the code more modern to fit modern legislative drafting standards so that it could be used as a legal resource. One of the comments that had been made in the New South Wales case was that although it was apparent that the code had been drafted with some legal input, it didn't look like a piece of legal drafting. And that was an important consideration for the court in deciding how the code might get used. So the bottom line is that the code has been changed or revised in order to modernise it. And the purpose has been to do that without changing the requirements. So what has changed? The first thing I've got to say is that the revisions were not designed to change the requirements that the code places on industry or those selling food in Australia or New Zealand. The revisions were made um, to update word clarify key areas and in some cases it's been necessary to revise key concepts. 
in an early draft of the code, we suggested that there might be quite a significant change in the structure of the code in order that it would meet more modern drafting standards. Uh, in the end, what we have is a revision that retains the current structure of the code and retains all of the current standard numbers um, with a couple of minor exceptions. The text has been modernised, but most of the code's structure has been maintained. As an example of key concepts that have changed, and this is perhaps the major area where key concepts have changed, the revised code refers to substances added to food by reference to the reason for which they've been added, rather than saying, for example, that food additives are prohibited and then listing the food additives that are permitted uh, without any definition of food additive. We now have a provision that says a substance that's added for the purpose of or used as a food additive is prohibited unless there is a permission and then we provide all of the permissions in standard 1.3.1. Uh, what you will see when you look at the new code is that it's remarkably like the current code. So on this slide we have standard 2.5.1 relating to milk and you will see that in layout it is substantially the same as the current code. What you will notice when you read throughout the code is that purpose statements have been removed from most provisions. Purpose statements are now a formal part of the code rather than being an informal part of the current code at the heading of each standard. Similarly, editorial notes have been substantially removed. Those changes have been made in response to recommendations made by the Office of Parliamentary Council to ensure that modern legislative drafting standards were adhered to. So what are the key points for industry? Um, the first thing that we note is that the current standard no numbers have been retained and what we've learnt in our consultations is that it's the standard numbers that are the important issue for most of industry uh, rather than the individual section numbers. Section numbers have certainly changed. Um, a significant change made in the revision has been to put all definitions in one place in the new standard 1.2.2. This creates a dictionary of definitions for the whole of the code and is effectively in two parts. The first part is a list of general definitions and the second is a list of food definitions. There are then some special definitions for things like the new concepts of used as a food additive, used as a processing aid or used for nutritive purposes. Um, the revised code now refers to, for example, additives by way of reference to their technological use or purpose, not their name. The format and location of schedules has been changed. This was a major point of discussion in the um, consultations that we had. The schedules at present are located sometimes within standards and sometimes at the end of standards. Sometimes a schedule in one standard is referred to in another standard. What we've done in the revision is put all of these schedules in a separate set of standards in a second part of the uh, code so that you have the text at the beginning of the code and the schedules at the end. But those who are used to working with perhaps one standard together with its schedules will be able to electronically join that, that, stand, that text standard and the schedules that it relates to um, for their own purposes. As I've already mentioned, notes and purpose statements have substantially been removed. The revisions will take effect on 1 March 
2016. This means that there is now about 11 months for industry to familiarise itself with the provisions of the new code. As I've said, the new code does not substantially change requirements. Other changes to change requirements that were suggested to us have not been incorporated in this revision of the code. Um, and what will happen with those is that we will consider them over the next year or so to see whether further reform of the code should occur. Some discussions with industry have already occurred to start that process. So what should industry do to prepare for the revised code commencing on 1 March 2016? If you're involved in producing, manufacturing or selling food, you should familiarise yourself with the requirements that relate to your products. This is no more than familiarising yourself with the current code in many respects, but I encourage you to read the current code alongside with the new code as you go through your work to identify what the changes are and to note those changes in language and to assess any effect that there might be on your operations. As I've said, the intention of code revision has been that requirements will not be changed, but the language will change. I encourage you to call me or email me if, at Fazans if you think that a requirement has been changed. Considerable care has been taken to ensure that that hasn't happened, but I'd be pleased to hear from you. Uh, my email address is peter.may at foodstandards.gov.au if you think that any requirement has been changed. So that brings me to the end of today's presentation. I hope that I've given you the information that you require about why we've done a revision of the Food Standards Code, what the significant changes that have been made are, and what you as a participant in industry might do to familiarise yourself with those changes and prepare for the commencement of the code revision on 1 March 2016. I thank you for your attention today and please do not hesitate to contact me if you want any further information about code revision or the further work that we might do in relation to code reform identification. Thank you very much.